everyone. I am Stephanie Smith. I'm the Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Smart Museum of Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's <laughs> lecture, which is co-sponsored by the Smart Museum and the Open Practice Committee of the Department of Visual Arts here at the University. Can you all hear me okay? Is this... So, um, this is a really special moment because it's the first time that we're all gathered publicly and collectively to welcome Jessica Stockholder to Chicago. I can't see her over the computer. But, um, so Jessica was most recently at Yale University where she chaired the sculpture department. And she comes here to, to join us as the chair of the Department of Visual Arts. And that means that she's here wearing many hats as teacher, as, um, as administrator, as advocate for the many roles that the visual arts can play within a great research university like Chicago. The latter is crucial because we're in the midst of a really um, exciting moment here at the University of Chicago. For years we've had quite a vibrant contemporary art community here on campus that includes the, um, the really brilliant faculty that we have in uh, both the departments of visual art and art history as well as a number of people around campus who are also thinking about these questions from within their own um, sorry talking with hands on the microphone not so good um, but talking uh, people who are thinking about contemporary art from many different vantage points on campus as well as the work of the open practice committee the smart and of course the renaissance societies you know long-standing uh, explorations into the contemporary so that's all been going for a long time, but what's really exciting right now is the sense that this um, conversation about contemporary art, about the work of art and the work of thinking, is now um, extending out across many different corners of campus that it hadn't touched in the past. And, um, and so we have, uh, there, are, there are these university-wide initiatives that are creating structures that help us talk to each other more regularly, that help us think about platforms for creative experimentation across the disciplines, and it feels like a really good moment to be here right now. Jessica is an absolutely crucial addition to those conversations, and, um, and we're really, really glad she's here. But her capacities as teacher, as administrator, as leader, these are all subordinate to her work as a thinker and a maker and someone who thinks through making. And that's what we're here to hear, hear, to hear about tonight, Jessica's creative practice. So a few words on that. One of the most significant American artists of her generation, Jessica came to prominence in the 1990s with a body of work that immediately established her distinctive visual style and her intellectual preoccupations. Her work is um, kind of wonderfully um, mongrel mix of painting, of two-dimensional work, of um, uh, environmental installation, of sculpture, and it's distinguished by a precise and nuanced use of color, an inventive sense of composition, and a witty materiality. Je Jessica's art is grounded in everyday materials, and she has a strong feel for the ways that sculpture in particular, unfolds over time, in space, in the embodied perceptions of those who come in contact with it. Hers is an inventive, rigorous, and generous art. Her work has been seen all over the world, it's been extensively written about, and so she certainly could have rested on those laurels. But Jessica continues to push her practice, building on core concerns and extending them out into other kinds of enterprises, including writing, um, public art commissions, and also curating. So with a nod to that range, to close, I'll share a quote from um, a recent New York Times article by Holland Cotter that was responding to an exhibition called The Jewel Thief that Jessica co-curated at the Tang Museum at Skidmore College. So he described the show as a hybrid, so carefully shaped and thought through that it becomes something more. It's essentially a big piece of conceptual art. One that messes with given definitions of painting, drawing, sculpture, and architecture, and by doing so breaks those forms open. Such shows, whatever flaws they may have in execution, make art history, past and present, bigger and richer. They bring more guests, some strangers, to the table. And they assure us that art, in its many forms, is productively refreshed and promoted. 
So that's a really beautiful unpacking of the kind of creative um, ambitions that Jessica brings to this particular table right here, right now, at Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Stockholder. Hi. Thanks, Stephanie, for introducing me. And um, I've been feeling, I've been here for about four months now and uh, feel very welcomed. It's been one welcome after another. And, uh, and I'm really happy to uh, be at the University of Chicago. And my colleagues here are great. And the place is exciting. And the city also. Um, so I'm going to talk about my work and start with a more recent piece and then jump to some very early work and try to give some sense of how I came to do what I do. And I have way too many images, so I'll kind of slow down and talk about some work and just flip through some others. Um, so Seth, if we could turn the lights out. Um, this piece is called uh, Peer Out to Sea, and it's Peer, P-E-E-R, out to S-E-E. -E. Um, but it's, um, the title also refers to the fact that it's um, in front of, it's in the Crystal Palace in Madrid. This was last summer. And uh, the Crystal Palace was built as part of a World's Fair at the end of the 1800s. Um, and this work, like many that I make, is responsive to this particular site. So it's a temporary work. It was there actually for quite a long time, about eight months. Um, but the, it, the Crystal Palace is like a, a large tchotchka um, sitting in front of a man-made lake. And uh, you could, as you entered the building, you could walk up onto this platform, which was perhaps a little bit like a pier stretching out into the space of the building instead of out into the lake. And you could only walk on this platform. You couldn't walk on the floor of the space. The brown circular shape there is burnt into the wood. The turquoise is painted. This orange is a pigment that's on the floor, um, so it's a thick, uh, layer of powder. And the green star is algae on top of water, so it's a kind of star lake. And uh, this work is um, uh, perhaps a little bit more romantic than my work tends to be. There's the stars and a round shape that could be like the moon, and all of that speaks to the expanse of space inside the Crystal Palace, which is a, a kind of small mirror of the universe. But I think the romance is tempered a little um, by the kind of tchotchka, kitsch nature of the whole building. And then this is a column uh, made of um, plastic uh, containers, colored at the bottom, moving to white, and then transparent, um, that, that in a way mirrors the water fountain out front, which I think you can see a little bit in there. Um, so so I, I've made a lot of work like this, where I travel to see the space, um, think, t I take photographs, a floor plan, I, I, and then I make um, plans for the work and go back and take two or three weeks to make the work on site. And a work like that doesn't exist past the end of the show. And then this is a painting I made when I was 15 or 16. It's um, acrylic paint on paper. And I'm showing it to you because it's kind of my, my point of departure. I started as a painter. And uh, I made one or two paintings on stretched canvas, but I mostly painted on paper and unstretched canvas like this. And this piece I like to show because I was interested here in the space between the figures. And uh, I think I have been since then still interested in uh, the space between the body and the thing I make and the architecture um, as, as much as I'm interested in the object. 
And I, was, I grew up in Vancouver in Canada and studied with a sculptor, Maury Baden, who I was introduced to when I was 14. He was a friend of my father's and I took drawing lessons from him. Um, and he was quite critical of the unstretched canvas um, on the wall. Just talked about the history of easel painting and how easel painting is a, a, a rectangular mirror of the wall, a small mirror of the wall. It's rigid like the wall. And as such, it um, has a clear relationship to its context. And he didn't like the unstretched canvas in that respect. So I um, was wedded to the unstretched canvas in that I cared about its materiality. I was gluing things to unstretched canvas and I, I liked the objectness of it. So I start, th this here is masonite with uh, cloth glued to it. And uh, I started to um, use parts and pieces of things in relationship to the wall so that the wall became part of the work. And this is in 1983, just before I went to graduate school. It's in my father's backyard in Vancouver. Um, so having, so I've left out a lot of work from, from those parts of things on the wall. I started, I quickly realized that the wall framed the work, even if I didn't use a frame. And then I started to put things from the wall onto the floor and think about the space of the room in relationship to the image on the wall. And in this work, I took the backyard as another kind of container um, so that the edges of the yard framed the work. And that's a mattress and blue paint on the grass and a cupboard door and chicken wire. Um, and then I uh, applied to go to Yale um, just kind of on a whim because a friend of mine was applying. And uh, I went to Yale for graduate school. And this is a work towards the end of my time there called Please Don't Walk on My Grandmother. And uh, while I was at Yale, I had developed, you know, further developed a body of work that was uh, made in response to context um, and was ephemeral. And as a student, particularly coming from Canada, where there's, there was a very small art market and still is, um, I wasn't thinking about making objects. So I didn't really notice that my work bled from being a self-contained object to being something that was dependent on the place where it was installed. Um, until I kind of came towards the end of graduate school and realized I, you know, was well, one of the nice things about being in school was that you always have an audience. I was able not to notice that I wasn't making objects because I would fill my studio up with something. People would come in and then I would take it down and make something else. But looking forward to moving to New York, which is what I did, um, I, I, didn't want, I didn't want to be in my studio alone making things that um, had no audience. And so I made this towards the end of graduate school, both looking forward to that, to, to being out of school, and also um, thinking about influence, both, well, the relationship between uh, public influence, history, art history, and also my own grandmother, and uh, the intersection of personal history and public history. Um, this piece is called, um, um, I should remember this, but I don't. Um, and I don't have it here. Mm. Your, it's called Your Skin in This Weather-Born Eye Threads and Swollen Perfume. And uh, it was 1995, um, a show at the Dia Center for the Arts in New York, um, which is not there anymore. And uh, for this, with this work, you walked in, this was the entryway, onto um, this green shape, moves onto a cast um, pad of concrete. And this is the other end of that concrete. So the concrete was flush with the entryway, and the floor of the space was so sloped that the concrete had that thickness to it moving through. The concrete was cast level. And, um, you walked through this space 
um, through these things and um, then came out to from where this picture is taken, where you're, where you're standing in an empty white half of the gallery space, your back's to the gallery, the yellow cords are overhead, um, all feeding this uh, group of lamps that are on the far right of that image. And uh, in this work, um, the, all of those elements that you walked through, there's um, a swimming pool, kind of a vinyl swimming pool on end. Those are men's shirts stuffed with newspaper. There's bowling balls. There's carpet and fans and metal. All of those physical things that you walked through on, to, on that concrete pad from this particular point of view kind of flatten and become very pictorial. Um, and I, though I, I don't think I'm either just a painter or a sculptor, the work is clearly involved in both histories and conventions, um, I am very involved in picture making and framing. Um, and you know, and I, as you saw, I started working in a rectangle as a painter, and the work kind of grew to explore other boundaries and edges. And I, though the work occupies space or and fills rooms, I don't think of myself as making environments. I'm not interested in just shifting the nature of a room. I'm interested in making a kind of coherent whole thing that um, intersects the, the room. So that though the, the work I'm making, as in this case, this work can't exist without this room, it is nevertheless also independent of the room. This, and this work is called Sweet um, for Three Oranges. And uh, this was in Barcelona. Um, and there's, those are butane heaters pointing at the wall so that there's a, an area of the air that's warmed up. So it's a warm volume of air. And those bird cages are filled with oranges, a solid volume of orange. And likewise with the trees, it's a rectangular volume of green. Um, and then those light bulbs just barely touch this um, painted shape on the wall, which has a kind of illusion of volume. And um, I'm, I'm always interested in the, um, the relationship between illusion, though my work is kind of abstract, it's not a, not a, a kind of literary illusion, it's a, a sort of physical or perceptual illusion of space pu pushed up together with the experience of moving through space physically. And picture making um, puts forward um, a sense of something that's still and timeless and static, which is quite different from the experience of moving through and around space, which takes place in time. Uh, so I, and I think that's part of the subject of my work, the relationship between uh, thought, which, is, which can feel timeless, and ideas which can feel static and timeless, next to the actual experience of experiencing of things in time. This piece was called Landscape Linoleum, and uh, it was in Belgium um, in 1998 in a sculpture park. It's installed in, a, in the classical side of a sculpture park. It's a temporary work. Those cars don't have any engines in them, so they're, they're mounted on a scaffolding. This is green paint on green grass. The sculptures are part of the classical collection in the park. Um, and then I cast these concrete blocks, which are oversized pedestals in relationship to the pedestals that were there with sculptures on them. These pathways were carved out in the park, this uh, orange and purple spray painted earth they, those pathways sat next to and kind of crossed and meandered around uh, pathways that were part of the landscape design of the park. And then there's this cut into the ground. And th this park was in the middle of a city, so when you're in the park you could hear the um, sound of traffic. And 
the park was very bounded and also a park like this is full of artifice though it's about nature it's not really natural it's it's as full of artifice as a gallery is and I, in a way I tr and I treated it in that same way so that the work is built against the bank of trees and um, and then there's this cut in the ground. There were two cuts like this into the ground which cut through the, the picture plane. So the grass is proposed as a picture plane of sorts and the trees also. And then these ropes that are in the background, um, those are a kind of drawing and also about time in that your eye can, they, they kind of are, they mark the way in which your eye moves so quickly, everyone's eyes move very quickly next to um, the speed at which a body moves. And uh, making things generally, uh, that's always a kind of a shock, how, e how quickly and easily you can think of doing something with material and how difficult and long it actually can be to, to move stuff around in space. That's a heater, uh, the white lamp-like thing is a heater, so again there's a volume of uh, air that's heated up. Um, so I, make, I have for many years now made works like that where I travel and the work is related to sight, but I also uh, make work in the studio that's uh, related to sight and that almost all of the work is made against the wall like this one is. This work is my ode to Robert Ryman. It's about as white as I can get. And, uh, and I, I really, um, as you can tell, love color. And uh, I think that I, I, it's difficult to put words to color. It's also, it, in fact, it's difficult to put words to my work at all because it's not, it's not narrative, it's not literary. I don't make this work from some kind of storytelling that goes on in my head. I'm not, at least in a conscious way, I'm not interested in what the objects mean. I'm more interested in using these objects uh, most of the time, this is an exception, here I'm interested in the still life and that you can sit in the chair and look at the still life matters. But I'm often interested in how, how materials are so much more meaningful than the word we put to them. Um, so to call something a chair resonates with chairs in the world and our use of chairs generally. But the, the precise material that a chair is made of, um, how it was made, how expensive it is, where it was made, what historical period it references, um, what the finish feels like, what the color is exactly like, and what the light's like on it, the, the, the specific qualities and particularity of every material transcends the word that you can put to it. And so I'm interested in, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm I care that all of these materials I use bring information with them from the world and that they have meaning, but I'm interested in orchestrating things in such a way that all of those other meanings that one can find in them have space and room to come to life. This piece is called um, Vortex and the Play of Theater with Real Passion in memory of Kay Stockholder, who was my mother, who was quite passionate and theatrical. And um, though I, I titled this work after I made it, I didn't make it with her in mind exactly. Um, in the foreground, there's a, a bunch of Lego and Duplo put together that make that multicolored shape. And that sits on some coffee tables that are puzzled together. And uh, all of that is next to these containers that are building, um, kind of used on construction site as small rooms or storage containers. And I thought of them as kind of equivalent to the Lego, but another scale. And then there's a bench here with a light on it. And the light points at this pink circle. And um, you can barely see, I think, in this image, there's some sort of roller painting on the wall there. And, there's, and it's a wood floor with 
a linoleum circle and then fake wood linoleum kind of pathway through the room. And uh, the paint on the wall is a kind of abstract expressionist roller painting. Um, and I've kind of put a light on it in a kind of self-conscious way. Um, I think that when, when I was in school, abstract expressionism was kind of derided and the whole notion that art might be expressive was kind of dismissed as ridiculous. Um, but I, I, and I do understand the stress and tension around the relationship of expression and art to how it might be significant. But I think that insofar as each of us is authoring a work, it is the expression of our person and uh, it doesn't matter how removed your hand is from making something, it's nevertheless an expression of the person who's putting it forward in the world and putting your name to it. And, uh, and I think that I have feelings is not so important, every one of us has feelings and what's important is um, how we make sense of our feelings and how we negotiate them and um, manage them in relationship to the culture at large. And that art, and in fact we don't think without feeling, we don't really separate our thoughts and our feelings. Our thoughts are informed by feeling and vice versa. Um, so um, I, I think that art is one of the places that, that we, where we make sense of that and struggle to make sense of how complicated we are in that way. Um, th this piece is called On the Spending Money Tenderly and uh, it was a piece in Dusseldorf, um, trying to, um, 2002. Uh, the, on the right side there, that's a kind of um, a, a quote from a market stall that was outside the gallery where they were selling fruit. And in this particular tent, there's a lot of round things. There's colored round balls, round Christmas decorations, a, a very little bit of real fruit, some fake fruit. This, this big room is a really awkward scale. Um, it's huge. And in this work, I proposed um, the small, seductive, glittering things that were like fruit. Um, and then this, that, and those things one could desire, you could like imagine picking one up. And then this big huge scale of the room, the, the, the smaller scale bridge to this larger scale. This is, sorry, this is a backwards left to right. Um, so, and this work for me was a kind of important work in that having spent many years traveling around making these big installation works for museums, being invited to fill one bigger, more awkward, weirder space after another because I'm relatively good at it and enjoy it, I started, it started to feel really very different than, than it had at the outset. Um, I started to feel like the hired spectacle for the occasion rather than um, a kind of quieter intervention in the space. And, uh, and also I, you know, get, I, I've been getting older as time goes on. And, uh, and uh, so with this work I, I started to question um, some of the assumptions that had been kind of given to me as a student and things that I'd kind of, we all grow up with assumptions. Um, and I grew up in the midst of a lot of art criticism that's kind of left-leaning and Marxist in its origin. And um, I'm a sort of left-leaning person. But, um, and the work that I grew up, that I made, I think participated in work that kind of, a, that proposed that by uh, abandoning its objectness, it was somehow resisting a capitalist market economy and that there was something radical in that and that there was something wrong. I don't know, how, I mean, people aren't quite this direct now, but when I was a student, you, people talked about selling out if you made things that were marketable and if they were if they, if they could be sold, um, but with but it it started to feel to me that these spectacles, the kind of spectacle culture that I'd been invited to participate in, was almost more conservative than the marketplace, 
and that it, it might be more radical to actually make small, intimate things. And uh, so in this work, I'm kind of proposing the small, intimate, private experience and the big, grand, public experience. Um, and also, th one of the things I really value in the art making experience is that it is private um, and that it's, um, it's, a, it's a circumstance, and I don't think there's so many of them in the world, where the agenda is set by the artist. Uh, you, no one that can tell you what to make or what you should make or what the right thing to make is. Each artist decides for themselves. And, uh, and then also the, pr the private experience of viewing art, if you go and you, to a museum or in your house you have a small painting, the very private experience of viewing is, um, I think it underlines and values the autonomy of thought that each person is capable of, where the viewing collectively of a spectacle involves a kind of relinquishing of that aloneness and singularity of thought. So I, I don't propose that we should only have one or the other, but in this work I was um, reevaluating those things for myself. Um, and then my work is also um, always about landscape. Um, so uh, this work here was in a show about Schwitters and it was called Gelatinous Too Dry and there's a lot of uh, photographs of um, the kind of um, blown up posters that people put in their basements to make it feel like nature is in the basement. So those, those posters are on the wall and uh, then you looked out this window to a park which is again full of artifice and I'm interested in I mean, the artifice of a park, it's, uh, parks are really part of our um, world. They're not fake, they're real parks, but they're full of a kind of fantasy and fiction, uh, a kind of creation that we've made for ourselves that, are, that we really live with. Um, and painting, I think, is, is like that too. And any, I mean, my work grew from the canvas to the wall and sometimes unpacking the wall and putting, cutting holes in the wall. And um, walls are also sites that are full of the possibility for illusion, which is why paintings are either on them or hanging on them. Um, but walls also cover electrical wires and plumbing and the structure of the building and the surface of the wall is, we don't think of it as a fiction, but it is, a, it is as fictive as a painting. It proposes an atmosphere and a quality of space that then becomes our real space. So I, I enjoy in art making the exploring the blur between um, what's invented culturally and collectively and then also on a more personal level the, the an exploration of attending to the difference between what's inside and outside myself first of all and then presenting that as an opportunity for other selves. Um, this work is uh, a permanent work in St. Gallen in Switzerland it's called Sign Waving Blush. And I have um, not done a great many of these, but right now I'm working on a couple of things that might be uh, permanent. And, uh, and, it's, and I, it's not, I wouldn't want to be an artist that only works in that public way because I really value the idiosyncrasy and uh, kind of casualness that's possible in the studio and in galleries when things aren't kept. Um, this was in, um, it's called Quiet Stops Rattling Thin Air, and uh, it was in Visby on the island of Gotland. This was one work where nobody I know went to see it. <laughs> and I, I'm actually, um, I mean, I, I've enjoyed traveling. I've done a lot of work in Europe in places like this where I, you know, I'm, I've been there for a couple of weeks and people I know for the most part don't see it. 
And uh, I, I have in the last, I think, five or six years um, really valued um, opportunities that come my way that are more local in this country and also closer to where I live. Um, I mean, I think the art world is in some ways become more and more international, but uh, actually we don't live internationally. We, we only live in one place at a time, and I, I like to feel rooted in the place that I'm in. Um, this piece was called TV Tip Toenails and the Green Salami, and it was in Bordeaux. Um, in this, when I took the job at Yale as the director of the sculpture department, I started to wonder what sculpture was. Before then, I hadn't worried about it too much. Um, but being the director of it, I thought I should think about what it was. And uh, I, I became attentive to the fact that it, whatever it is, it's a lot of different things, it's very theatrical and uh, involves a real attention to, since the sculpture kind of came off the pedestal, if it's not on a pedestal and it's not a painting hanging on the wall, it's part of the space of the room and the room frames it and a, as a viewer in the room with something that's that part of the room, you become part of the, the work also. Um, so I, I, for that reason I tended to put a lot of seats in my work places where the viewer could sit and view, but also sit and be seen, be kind of framed as part of the work. This white platform here has a lot of uh, white appliances on it, a fan, toaster, microwave oven. Um, they're all plugged in, but they don't do anything. I think some of them might have a little hum. And uh, then there's this TV with a blue screen, which is about as close as I get to making video. <laughs> and uh, I, I like some video um, and think a lot of, actually a lot of great video is being made, but I'm actually more interested in the real slowness of material. I'm interested in the fact that nothing lasts forever and that though concrete feels really solid and you know, difficult to move and it, in fact, that there's movement in it, and it's a really, really slow movement, and if I just stand still next to it, I'm really fast. This is a fake heater, um, so it's a kind of a, 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 a still image. Um, this is a show that was called uh, Tabletop Sculpture. Um, I'm trying to remember what the date was. Mm -hmm. I don't have it here, but it was maybe maybe 10 years ago, something like that. And uh, in this show, I kind of proposed two things. I wondered for myself what the, why it was that all my work was against the wall and involved a wall, the, the studio work, it all involves a, a wall. So I proposed uh, that I, I wouldn't do that. That I, and I made some works that didn't sit against the wall. So in the foreground here, there's a table that's sitting out in the middle of the room. There, you can see there's a little blue piece a little bit further back. This work sits out in the middle of the room. Um, but I found that when the work wasn't attached to the wall, I needed to establish a different kind of context for it. And uh, so I invited... Uh, a lot of different artists to be in the show with me. And they're people who I felt to be part of my context, people who influenced me, people whose work I worked in relationship to. And there are some famous people who I never met, like Cindy Sherman and Robert Morris. And there, and my husband, Patrick Chamberlain's in the show, and my cousin, Macy Awad, and Jerry Pethick, who's well known in Vancouver. And, um, uh, First Nations artist, um, oh, I'm just forgetting his name, which is terrible, um, whose work I really admire, um, and and very and some students of mine and friends of mine in New York, and so and it's a former teacher of mine, Maury Baden. Um, so the work on the wall was a kind of co another kind of context for my work, and also this red carpet stretched over the entryway. 
So you had to walk through this kind of seating area that was treated as kind of a living room. And the furniture in there was some of it uh, kind of not noteworthy. And then like this marshmallow, Herman Miller chair, a little bit more noteworthy. So it kind of hovered between whether it was designed or important or just mundane. Um, and so people did sit there. You could sit there. Uh, and then the rest of the gallery was full of my work. Um, so having proposed that question, uh, I have since then continued to make work against the wall for the most part. Um, I, um, I, I really am attached to um, picture making and the possibilities that the wall presents that way. And I, I like the work to be cited and tied to the architecture in one way or another. And um, so that's what, I mean, I ask quite different, I, I keep asking questions in different ways. This work was called Sam Ran Over Sand or Sand Ran Over Sam. And the title was proposing um, a question about narrative and wondering about narrative in my work, which, uh, in which there really is no Sam. Um, who's, who's a protagonist, but I think that uh, materials have character. And uh, this is white styrofoam with white light on it, and uh, lights on coolers. There's another projected still image, the red and blue on the back wall there. Um, so, and this is a white freezer on white coolers. And look, looking Backwards at my work, um, though I say that I don't work in a narrative way, and it's true, I, I don't sit around making up stories about the work, I, um, I notice that I've used a lot of coolers and refrigerators. And ref Actually, I did a piece here at the Wren um, many years ago, and it was a piece that was full of refrigerator doors. Um, and I think that there's a really lovely metaphor uh, where a freezer or a refrigerator is a bit like the gallery. It, they're both cold and they tend to be white and rectilinear and they're also full of love because freezers and refrigerators are full of food which are, is in some ways about love and uh, galleries too are full of art which are also giving in that same way. Um, and then I've also used a lot of light um, and I'm interested in light as it's linked to color. That you can't see color without light. So color is both very physical and attached to the thing it's on, whether the thing is full of color in its own right, like a skein of yarn or oranges, or if in this case these are drop ceiling tiles that are painted and it's a skin of pigment. You can't see those colors without light, and the color of the light shifts the color of the pigment. So um, color is both very physical and, and ethereal at the same time. And I really enjoy that about it, and that quality of it matches a kind of basic kind of questions about being human, um, the relationship between thoughts and feelings, which which don't seem to have physicality, as best we can tell, um, and our bodies and our lives, which seem to be entirely physical. Um, and then color, too, is very difficult to articulate. Um, you know, why it's important, why some color is exciting and satisfying and others aren't. I'm going to flip through a bunch here. This is PS1, and then I make, the, so I work at different scales. This is kind of the scale of your head. It doesn't involve your body. It's a small thing on the wall. This is more like a furniture scale. Um, this piece uh, is, a, I guess, a few years old now. I really like this piece a lot. It's, it's kind of puts together these different kinds of plastic. There's this black lid to um, a, a kind of, plastic tub that's squeezed in this aluminum frame. And then there's a plexi, a clear plexi leaning against the wall with some other kinds of clear plastic stuck to it. And uh, some other clear 
translucent kinds of plastic things stuck together, dangling from the ledge. And um, this work is generated by um, the quality of the surface um, that's difficult to articulate in the same way that it's difficult to articulate why a color is so exciting. But there's something about the matte quality of that black, and you can't see it so well in this image, but the texture that it has is a kind of, um, it's made to look like something else. I mean, plastic could take on, it doesn't have a texture of its own, it's given a texture. And in that way, it's a kind of nostalgic material. The things that are made out of plastic around us are full of nostalgia for the way things used to be made. Um, it, it has texture because wood has texture and stone has texture. Um, and well, when I moved from, I lived in New York for 12 years and then I moved to just outside of New Haven when I took the job at Yale. And um, it was the first time I'd lived in a place where there were a lot of uh, big like Home Depot stores and staples and where you could just drive up and park next to those stores and watch people um, moving things from the store into the car and you can imagine other people and yourself moving those things from your house to the dump in pretty short order. Um, so to kind of witness this flow of material because nothing is made that well. It's all made pretty cheaply and a lot of it's not made here in the United States. So to become kind of aware of that flow and the quality and then to also to feel a conflict about the quality of things. Um, if, if things are made really well, really high quality, if you buy a handmade table, that table requires so many man hours of labor that it becomes uh, possible to own, be owned only by really wealthy people. And, and as such, it then becomes full of a significance and status that the love of making that went into it, um, it doesn't participate in. I guess it's about a clash of values. And uh, I think art always is involved in a kind of clashing of values. Um, the, co the price of things, generally of art objects, doesn't bear resemblance to the thinking and feeling value that the, the works embody. The, the art market and the price attached to art objects it, it bears some other kind of value. This is called Sex in the Office, and again, it's about the plastic surfaces. Um, what else can I say? The things, that I, the things that I have to say about the work kind of tend to come afterwards. Um, my work is really about uh, ex an experience. It's about the experience of making it and the experience of looking at it. And there are many different kinds of um, stories, words that can be put to it. Um, this work here, this, there's a, an African mask that's part of this work. There's a detail of it. And I bought that mask at uh, TJ Maxx, about 10 minutes from where I was living. It cost $14. It's a handmade mask from Ghana. And I happened, when I was a kid, I lived in Ghana for a couple of years, so it had a particular resonance for me. But there's just something so weird about the world, you know, where you have this thing that was made by hand that in a way is art. In another way, it's clearly not great art. It's made for this market that's got it, you know, landed in TJ Maxx. And it's being sold next to these plastic tubs and towels and sheets. And um, there's just something very strange about the quality of the things that we live with. I, I think this lamp that I bought at Home Depot is really beautiful and kind of hideous all at once. But... Uh, uh, I loved it. Um, this was in Madison Square Park um, last, not last summer, but the summer before. It's called uh, Flooded Chambers Made, made with an M-A-I-D. And uh, it, 
it, kids loved it. Uh, I th this was a garden that was planted in relationship to the geometry on the platform. And here's the same work moved to St. Louis. It's presently in St. Louis at the Laumeier Sculpture Park. And in this work, I'm interested in the rationality of the patterning that I put on this platform mixed with its irrationality. So the shapes are geometric and lines. Uh, one, you know, the way the shapes bump into each other give rise to the adjacent shape, but there's a whimsy to it. Uh, so it's both governed by its geometry and also entirely whimsical. Whoops, that was there again. So let me jump through. Um, this, I think, is, might be the last thing I have to talk about. This is a model for the show that um, Stephanie uh, mentioned, where I co-curated a show with um, Ian Barry at the Tang Museum last fall. And uh, he invited me to co-curate with him and proposed that it was uh, a kind of open invitation, but that he didn't know what he meant exactly by inviting me and that I should think about what I wanted to do with it. So I proposed these, this series of pedestals. The smallest one was two feet by two feet and it moved out the door of the gallery to a 14 by 14 foot pedestal. And then there was a platform in the corner and carpets on this other corner. Um, so this is, you walked into the gallery, there's, and then, so the people, there were about 60 artists in the show um, a, a good number of them were works from the collection of the Tang. And then the people we invited were uh, probably about my generation, P New York people, people who were part of my milieu, whose work I was aware of, that Ian was aware of, that we kind of were part of our world. We, we, it was a really lovely process working with him. Um, we didn't articulate every nook and cranny of what we were doing. We just set about doing it and kind of bumped into things and talked about them as we went. So this is the 14 by 14 cube on the right there with Jim Hodges painting on it. And there's also a, a bleachers on the left so you can sit up on the bleachers and look at paintings. Um, <clears throat> this is inside the gallery. That's Liz Larner in the back corner. Uh, Chris Martin on the right here, Virgil Marty, wallpaper and chandelier. There's, um, I, I don't remember the top painting, that's my husband's painting, Patrick Chamberlain underneath, the little one. Um, Richard Rezac is in this show, I know he's in the audience. Um, so the, so this, this situation um, um, kind of blurred the boundaries of what might be a pedestal and what might be an artwork. So this uh, kind of uh, ramp, table, platform in the foreground here is sort of a sculpture, but the platform from where the picture is being taken is not really a sculpture, it's more like a pedestal. Um, and, uh, and the show, the show the intention was to show the work of all of these people to best advantage. It wasn't my intention to use this work for my own ends. I really wanted to celebrate the work of the people in the show and to, there's Richard's work, and to provide a circumstance where the work could really be enjoyed. This is a Jessica Jackson Hutchins and um, Alan McCullum behind, Jorge Pardo, chandeliers, and um, uh, Charles Long in the foreground there, and Cheryl Donegan in the back corner. This is a little chandelier of mine with Cheryl Donegan's paintings behind. Um, so then there's some wallpaper on plywood, and there's kind of, so the, the, it was, the whole show was kind of a, it merges with my other work in that it's about questioning framing and means of display and, and the bracket. And uh, I, in my work and in the, my looking at other people's work, I enjoy 
Um, this is a, a good friend of mine, Alana Herzog's work on this cube. Um, I enjoy um, the neutrality that the gallery proposes, this empty, blank, white space. Um, and I enjoy the intensity of experience that that framing off from the rest of the flow of life makes possible. And at the same time, it's not quite believable that, that art is so distinct from the rest of life. And uh, so I, in many ways in my work, I'm always interested in boundary and a kind of question of divide between things. Um, so let me just move. There's actually one more thing to talk about here. Um, this, sh this show is still up at the Aldrich Museum, and uh, it's called uh, Hollow Places Court in Ash Tree Wood. The whole show was called that, and there were a number of different pieces in the show. These are two screens, one's thin and one's fat. Um, all of these pieces of, with wood are made from this ash tree that was cut down from the backyard of the Aldrich. And uh, so I worked with a cabinet maker, a furniture maker, to make these pieces. And these, these ones are painted by hand. And uh, then they're installed in relationship to these mirrors and the drop ceiling. Um, I, I kind of understood the mirrors and the drop ceiling to be part of an, a situation, not exactly a work. Well, the screens are themselves a work. And then in another room, these were boards from the same ash tree that were screen printed on. And this is called ash tree wood. And they were, this line of uh, blue was made in relationship to the window height. And uh, I, I was thinking here about um, picture making again. And come, oh, that's right from the beginning. Coming from Vancouver, um, I grew up with a lot of uh, First Nations or Indian work around me and really loved that work and I played in the woods with totem poles before they were moved inside. And uh, I, I've, I love the formality of that work and I love the way in which um, the, the, the totem poles um, propose another kind of place or relationship to sight, not unlike windows, I think. I think it's a particular kind of picture making. And a lot of the imagery on those poles um, it, it is made in relationship to the shape of the eye. So the eye is like a, a frame that we look out from. Our eyes frame what we see and windows frame what we see. And property lines also tend to frame what we see. So when moving to Connecticut in a kind of suburban neighborhood, I became aware of the property lines. And looking at my property, I was looking at what it looked like between the two lines of ownership. And everybody else in the neighborhood seemed to be doing the same thing. Um, and looking out of a window, a window kind of frames your vista. Um, and I, I don't know enough about totem poles to say anything with great certainty, but I think totem poles are also about um, a, a proposing a kind of relationship to the place and a kind of ownership, um, a marker of, kind, of a kind. Um, so, uh, so in this work, I'm kind of exploring that picture making in a, in a different way. Um, so that, that's the last images I have. I just wanted to say one more thing, um, that my work generally is also very much about pleasure. It's unabashed in its pleasure in terms of co about color and a kind of composition. And in some ways, maybe it's quite conservative in that respect. It's part of a long history of people who've worked um, with this kind of picture making, you know, Matisse and Cezanne and um, you know, Michelangelo, and I mean, I, 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 my work I, feels to me quite fluid with art history in that way. And, um, and I actually uh, came to think about pleasure as really very meaningful and important for art to engage. I don't think it's just bourgeois or without significance. I think that how we 
uh, culturally and, and as humans deal with pleasure is charged and complicated and that art is a really good place to try to make sense of some of that. So thank you. So maybe we should turn some lights on and then I can see you too. I tend to title them afterwards, um, and I don't. I, it's obviously not true that there's no narrative, um, but it is true that I don't work from a place of focus on narrative, and um, and I have become more interested in words as I've gotten older, and I I like I'm, I like to play with words in a way that's equivalent to or parallel to the way I play with materials. So I like the words to be multivalent and kind of move around and mean different things in combination with each other. And, I, and I'm also interested in psychoanalytic theory and, um, and the experience of psychoanalysis, which proposes that um, life and imagery and narrative in relationship to life, particularly dreams, are multivalent. That there's no one way to think about how your life is meaningful. You can put many narratives to life and, and a fantasy that you have or a dream that you have can mean many different things at once. So I enjoy language in that way in relationship to what I make. I, I really value the making that I do. You know, I, I'm not an artist that just appropriates things and represents them. You know, I don't take a chair and move it from the store to the gallery and say, that's my art. I value the, the intersection of my own imagination, invention, experience with the things that I use to work with. I, I think that I'm kind of curious, like what's a raw material? A raw material, is it dirt? Well, if you go to Home Depot and buy dirt, that's not really a raw material. It's sort of fabricated dirt. Um, is a two by four a raw material? Well, it came from a tree, but it's been milled to a particular size, and it, it, it participates in a system, a cultural system of building. So I, I don't think there's a hard line between any of us as maker and participating in the systems and structure of the world that we're making things in. Um, that slippage, I think, is, is mirrored at, you know, when you ask the question of artist and curator. I mean, I'm a curator insofar as I'm buying all these materials, these objects that other people designed and made and putting together in some other way. Maybe you could see me as a curator that way. When I worked with Ian Barry, um, he's a curator. I was sort of a curator, but I, but I wasn't a curator um, in the same way that he was. And it was interesting to work with him and kind of, kind of observe his skills as a curator and observe that I had a very different set of skills. Um, you know, there's slippage. It's also interesting that the curatorial role has become so professionalized over my lifetime. When I was a kid, curator, there was no curatorial school. People who, kind of eccentric, strange people who loved art and had done different things ended up being a curator. Um, so that, that's become kind of professionalized. Um, I, I mean, I don't know what to make of the trend past that. I think, it's a, I think that, that it's a way of asking questions 
to put people in, into different, to perform different roles for which they are not exactly suited or educated. It's a way of asking questions about the category. And I certainly enjoy, I really enjoyed um, pretending I was a curator. Well, that was, of course, the question. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not right to say those situations because I've only done it once. Um, and, you know, if I, the, you know, on the, kind of in a flat way, um, if I was invited to be in a show where another artist was going to use my work to participate in their work, that wouldn't sound too good to me. And I would be, you know, wouldn't have been surprised if all of the artists I invited said no and were pissed off and didn't like it. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a delicate proposition. But in fact, people did like it. No one said no, and um, everyone who I was involved with seemed to enjoy it and feel that their work was well treated. So, and perhaps part of that is because it was a situation of peers. You know, the people who were in the show were people who were, were part of the same world. So it was a kind of playful um, mixing of people now. It wasn't historical. There was, there was like some older work. There was some, um, Annie Albers had some work in it. There was a few older people, but they weren't there. They weren't there to object. Uh, <laughs> so the people who were there were all sharing a social moment. Well, yeah. Um, Stephen's work kind of involves a certain pleasure that takes a long time to experience, kind of like slow pleasure. Um, have you found that value either to yourself or others kind of changing or modifying as you're, you move through your career? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by slow pleasure, um, <laughs> but um, but when I was in when I was a graduate student, people didn't understand. A lot of people didn't understand what I was doing at all, and I, I had the experience often of um, people saying, "Oh, now I get it," you know, that people would take some time and then they would kind of cotton on to the structure that I was playing with. Um, so in, that maybe addresses what you're asking a little bit. Um, some pe not everybody thinks it's pleasurable. I mean, the work is, is not about ease. It's about, um, you know, what's beautiful. Some pe for some people, things are beautiful that are most comfortable in reinforcing of a, a status quo, of making things the same and insisting that they be the same. I, I find things beautiful that propose um, an opening or the possibility that things be different. Not that they always should be different. I mean, you know, life is what it is and um, it can't always be different. But it's exciting to shed light on um, the possibility that one can think differently about the world and also to notice um, how limited any thought or point of view is. Uh, I mean, I, th I think that I'm kind of always struck by that over and over again that you know, I can only see out the front of my body, I don't have eyes out of the back of my head, I can only be in one place at a time, and that I can't ever step out of time. And it, that's a bit frustrating. Um, <laughs> Thank you. 
No, I was just very fortunate, I think, to be invited. I, I mean, I, I started in Vancouver. The first time I addressed a gallery in that way was Open Space Gallery in Victoria. And a, a student who had been a student there with me, Barbara Fisher, who's a curator in Toronto now, was the curator at Open Space. And uh, she invited me to show some drawings. And f I don't know why I didn't want to show my drawings. I asked instead if I could do something in relationship to the space. And she said yes. And so that was the first time I did that. And um, I'm trying to remember. How, and that, you know, I, it just, I was, I, I've always wondered about that too. Why people, you know, said, oh yeah, come make a mess in the gallery and we'll see what happens, you know, but it, they did. <laughs> Um, well, the, for the work that's site-related, I, I get the stuff in the place where the work is. So I don't collect stuff for that. I, like for the piece I did here at the Renaissance Society, that must have been 20-something years ago now, I called Suzanne and said I'd like to use a lot of refrigerator doors. And, you know, she sourced them and found them. And, um, and I collect stuff in my studio, but there's a limit to what it makes sense to collect because if whatever's on the bottom of the pile is forgotten about. So it, I can easily drown in too much stuff. You know, you get to fill the studio up with stuff, there's no room for me in it, and um, I don't know what's in it anymore. So there's a, and then having moved, you know, I just moved here after having lived in Connecticut for 12 years, and um, we threw away a lot of stuff. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the role of documentation in your work? Because obviously when you're showing it here, we can't have anything mm -hmm. here. And um, for the most part, I've seen the work through documentation and, and documentation of installation. But I'm interested in how you think about the about perspective and photography and mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm really fortunate that a piece of what I'm interested in the work it translates really well photographically. Um, I'm interested in composition. I'm interested in framing. So the, I tend to like the photographs I take the best. I photograph all of my own work. And sometimes my photographs are technically not good enough and I use a photographer's work, but I always, pho I always photograph my own work. And um, so that's been lucky, but it's limited. The work is easier in photographs because in reality, moving through one of those spaces, there are moments when it comes together and it's kind of slick and really classical and perfect and then other moments where it's just a mess. You know, so you kind of move through space and it comes together and falls apart. And, um, and the, photo the photographs don't show that. Um, the photographs of the piece I did at the Tang Museum, that's one of the more frustrating things I photographed. I don't think you can really get a sense of what that show was like at all through the photographs. Oh. Oh. I was in college, so how old does that make? Would I was like twenty something, twenty one, something like that. And was there a moment that, uh, that you really shifted from, or, or was it kind of like where you were? No, it was really a a, 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 sl a you know, it, it was like a very fluid process. You know, there's something on the wall, and then I put a wire from the wall to the floor, and then I put things on the floor in front of the wall, and then I started to think about the things themselves having surface and carrying image. But the, Im the way I use m things, I use them, I'm interested in there being some sense of complete image that's distinct from the materials that's holding the image. 
So all of the materials are a little like a canvas, you know, but the image kind of falls off of these things. So the, Im the things are both there, they're physical facts, and they participate in a picture making, but the picture, the complete picture, transcends the edges of any single thing. Hmm. Say more about what you mean by cultural context. Um, yeah, I mean like the use of sort of refrigerators and sort of things that, like furniture, things that are in like relation to the body. Um, I don't know, there's sort of like heavy sort of domestic tones in that. Hmm. Well, there's domestic tones in refrigerators and public tones in cars. <laughs> um, well, I, I, th I think that language grows from physical experience. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you mean by heavy tones of domesticity. Everything has significance. You know, refrigerators are, tend to be domestic, but they're also in offices and restaurants. And, you know, we own cars personally, but we live on streets full of them. The plastic stuff that I'm using, I mean, I, all these cheap plastic things, many of them made in China, there's a certain kind of pleasure pain in those things. Uh, they're beautiful, you know, the colors of cheap plastic are really beautiful, but they're without value, you know, they're on their way to the dump, and, uh, and nobody gets paid very much for making them, and we're all aware of the dumps filling up. So they're, but they're, but we love having things flow through our houses, you know, we get bored owning just one thing, we're part of this consumer culture and we all enjoy it. Um, so there's a kind of pleasure pain in that. That's cultural. Well, I, I came from that background in that the critical world that I grew up in, I think the more, most of the really interesting art criticism has kind of grown from a thinking about how things are valued in relationship to a Marxist understanding of value. And then there's a kind of knee-jerk um, teaching and being part of groups of artists. There's often a knee-jerk assumption that everybody in the room shares the same politics. <coughs> You know, we're all leftists, we all want our work to change the status quo and there's something wrong with the way it is and, it's got, and art's all about, you know, being this left-wing agent of change, which can't be true. Not everybody in the room agrees about politics, um, ever. And, uh, and my father was a Marxist. He, was kind of, he, was, he grew up in the 30s and he was part of that moment. Um, so I was, I mean, it's part of the world I grew up in. I'm not really a very heavily ideological person myself. What, you know, I mean, I tend to, uh, you know, I, I didn't vote for Bush. But. <laughs> you just mentioned uh, very briefly something about the idea of value. I mean, your lecture, you were talking about very briefly also about the idea of the spectacle. And I'm wondering um, if in your new appointed position, the two will consider the idea of spectacle and if audience That's, that's, that seems like two questions kind of shoved together. Um, well, in this position, my job is, I think, both to argue for and try to make room for the things that I value, while at the same time respecting the work of my colleagues and, and the fact that the world is full of a lot of different points of view and values, different kinds of value in art. Art's such a weird umbrella. I mean, there's people under this one umbrella doing things that hardly speak to each other. Um, 
so I, I don't see it as my, I mean, I, I see it as my job to make room for the wideness of what art is. Um, and I, and, you know, insofar as spectacle is part of the art world um, and useful in many different ways, I, I don't see it going away and I'm certainly not going to rail against it, you know, and say it shouldn't exist. On the other hand, I, I care to make room for something that isn't spectacular also. Thanks.